HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink, inspiring public curiosity about food. Learn more at mofad.org. This week on Meet and Three, we bring you stories about the coldest, darkest season. We start in a California vineyard. It's cold, but it's wet, and things are still alive. There's a lot of life in this soil. We explore two frontiers of cocktail culture— luxury ice, and the rise of non-alcoholic drinks. The rocks traditionally becomes 25% of your drink's volume, and as such, it imparts smells and tastes. And we investigate the risks facing New York City delivery workers during the harsh winter. In the wintertime, after two hours of biking, it's quite easy, actually, for the bikes to sing upside down or slips or slide. Tune in to this week's episode of Meat and Three, that's M-E-A-T plus sign T-H-R-E-E, for some food for thought to sustain you through the dead of winter. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to the Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Michelle DeFeo. We'll talk to Michelle about women and wine, champagne, and of course, of course, Laurent Perrier. We'll taste a cuvee rosé and a grand siècle la le. All right, my French sucks. During the show, which <laughs> Michelle was uh, gracious enough to bring in. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for the Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. All right, Jersey Girl. Push <laughs> that in your face. You're stuck, Love it. You're stuck with that. For I'm life. proud of it. Jersey Girl Michelle DeFeo pursued, pursued her childhood love of France, studying French in college and abroad in the Loire Valley. She did a stint in banking, worked in wine importation, sales, marketing, distribution, and at one point, Laurent Perrier. She left to become a VP at Remy Contro USA, managing seven brands, eventually coming back to Laurent Perrier to become president of the U.S. subsidiary with more than, what is it, 10, 20 years in the oh, biz, gosh, in if champagne. I have to count, it's over twenty at this point. Michelle yeah. is a true champagne uh, expert and specialist. All right, welcome to the show, Michelle. Thank you so much, Sam. It's a pleasure thank, to be here. Thanks for coming in. A uh, couple of sidebars. Uh, I'm not sure, but this is either our 99th or 100th show. I'm supposed to know that. Uh, it could be either one. I think it could be our hundredth. Um, so this is going to be show 100A, and next week will be B. But it's perfect because our 100th show, we're celebrating with Champagne, a great champagne house, and Michelle, a great person. I, I think that deserves a cheers, if we may. There you go. Like and we got uh, the champagne poured. Yeah. Um, all right, Michelle, let's, let's set up for everyone who you are. Um, give everyone a little background 
uh, about your journey in life and wine that got you currently to where you are, which is running the uh, U.S. subsidiary of Laurent Perrier. So how did I go from northwestern New Jersey to Champagne, France? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's been a great trip. Um, you know, I, I uh, studied French in college. I was the first person in my extended family to ever go to college. And really? I just kind of thought, well, I will study something. And I'd fallen in love with France a number of years prior to that. I saw an image of the Eiffel Tower on TV. That simple, huh? It was that simple. And even just as a kid, I thought, that's so cool. I want to learn about that stuff. So I majored in French in college and political science, which basically qualified me to argue about politics in French. And of course, if you're going to do that, you might as well drink while you're doing it. Right. So I got out of school, fell into banking for a little while, didn't like that, didn't have enough French, didn't have enough of you know political science or anything else. Answered a, a job posting for a wine company and landed a job as an admin to some company I'd never heard of called Veuve Clicquot. <laughs> and that was when really very few people had so heard of that brand. you didn't know much brand. about champagne in those days, Very obviously. few people even knew about that brand okay. in those days. We're talking mid-90s here. Okay. It wasn't marketed through here the way it is now. Right? No, no. Okay. I, I kind of regret the good work that I did back then. No, no. <laughs> uh, so so started working uh, as an admin there and then got bitten by the wine bug. And through some friends, got a job as a, working at a retailer in Brooklyn to learn that side of the business. And then through how long some, did you do that? I worked. Uh, I worked both jobs for about two years. I worked on the floor of the retail store and doing some bookkeeping for them on the weekend. So you got to taste and learn Absolutely. about different exactly. Okay. And then one of the guys there was uh, doing a, a kind of a TA at the International Wine Center under Mary Ewing Mulligan. So I got to be a TA and learn about wine and do WSET tests there, which was great. Okay. And then? Then you just went to get bitten by the wine bug, as they say. You just don't go back. And then everything I wanted to do revolved around the wine industry. I uh, moved to California to be closer to the vines. Realized, uh, you know, I thought, well, what do I want to do within this amazing business? And, of course, it sounds so glamorous, making wine. And then I realized, oh, so there's, like, a lot of bugs, and I have to learn chemistry. Okay, that's not going to be the part of the wine industry for me. I have right. you know, so much respect for winemakers, but that's those are skills and tolerances that I don't have. Um, but I really loved talking about it, and I loved educating people about it. So I worked for a distributor and then uh, a fantastic fine wine distributor called the Henry Wine Group, which is now part of the Winebow Group. Right. And then from Big. there, uh, really focused on French wines and still coming from Clicquot uh, and loving Champagne. Laurent Perrier was actually establishing their subsidiary at that time, and some friends from the industry said, hey, why don't you come on board with, with us? And Laurent Perrier, even though it's one of the largest brands in the world, we've only been in the U.S. since 1998. That's when we established our subsidiary. Really? It's really been very hit or miss before that, even though we've been around since 1812. Right. So I thought, well, this is a bit risky. It's a subsidiary of this company, and they don't really know the U.S. market. But I jumped. And that was in 1998, and I started representing Laurent Perrier then and fell in love with, even more so with Champagne, and of course with the people and, and the Champagnes themselves. And then wanted to learn more than just sales. So I went and worked in various aspects of the wine industry, worked for an accounting firm that you had... left Laurent Perrier. I left Laurent Perrier. Right. And, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I think is so... Uh, that I... A lot of people ask me, well, how do I get into the wine business? And I said, well, it's not about just loving wine. That's, that's intrinsic to it. But you also have to know business. And I needed to go out and I needed to learn more business. So I worked for a consulting firm that did boring accounting and understood cost of goods and the impact of a barrel and what does it mean when you use a barrel from a financial perspective. Um, <clears throat> and then also went back to school and got my MBA. Wow. And then after doing all that stuff, I said, you know what, I want to go back to my real love. And luckily it worked out with Laurent Perrier that they had an opening to lead the subsidiary. And I've been doing that now for eight years. So when you went back, you went back as president or you went back and ascended to the presidency of the U.S.? Technically, it was executive vice president, okay. but the same role. Okay. And then I said, no, look, I want, I want the big title. Um, all right. So that's a pretty nice climb. Um, do you, can you recall any other current women running champagne houses? Well, Marie Giuliano, who's quite famous, was running Clicquot when I was working there. Right. Um, and uh, anyone who knows Mireille from either her books or from working with her or for her knows that she has a very specific style of management. Uh, and she was very, very successful and can largely be credited with what that brand is today. So I got to see her in a management role. And I have to say, at that point, I had gone to Douglas College, which is an all-women's 
college at the time within Rutgers University. So I had always been surrounded by women. All of the deans were women. I had lots of professors who were women. And then I worked in an organization that had a strong woman at its helm. And it never occurred to me that we were in the, in the minority in the industry. I had really only seen women in positions of power. Interesting. And you know, we think so much about whether it be you know, the, the importance of seeing anyone of, of your own race or of your own gender in a position of power and the impact that that has on your mentality. It never occurred to me that it should be difficult for a woman to ascend in this industry. Um, but uh, so, so having that, I wouldn't say she was a mentor. We didn't work together that closely. Um, but I just always felt, okay, I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to, you know, women right. should be in, in, involved at a Good high level. Good example or role model. Yeah. Um, how do we think women are doing in the business now? Let's say wine world. Let's say champagne world overall. I mean, be honest. Well, if I compare it to the late 90s, so my kind of post Clico days, post-distributor days even, and my first days as what we'd call a supplier at this level, uh, that was a bit of a smack in the face. That was like, oh, wait, this is hard, and there are a lot of people who don't trust me. Um, because you were a woman? Because I'm a woman, because I'm, I was young-ish at the time. You know, I'm Both. talking about being a little below 30, and, and it was very difficult to be taken seriously. And the women at that time were, they were the promo models. Right. They were, okay, well, you're hired to stand here and look pretty. stereotypical. And they'd be looking at me like, well, your skirt's a little long and you're right. not real, really pretty enough to be doing this job. But okay, you know, I guess, you know. So, but that was kind of the, the place that I was in. And it's gotten a lot better. Although I will say that it was only about three, or, about three years ago that I was sitting at the table of honor at one of the largest wine event, events in the industry of wine. Kind of one of these awards dinners thing. And I was sitting next to big luminaries in the industry. And right next to me, I was the only person from Laurent Perry in attendance. And the person right next to me was from another large wine company. And he turned to me, and I was introduced, and they said, this is Michelle DeFeo from Laurent Perrier. And he turned to me and said, oh, are you the brand ambassador? Just an assumption right away. And that's the assumption, is that if you're and a that's, woman... you're saying three, four years. This is that's only a reason. few years ago. Yeah. So this is, I'm not the young, you know, the young thing standing behind the table anymore. Yeah. But there's still that assumption that a woman wouldn't be in power. So it's gotten better, but we still have a huge way to go. And actually, we're, uh, we, we announced it back in October, and we're about to, to put the final touches on it. Laurent Perrier and myself are putting together a, a scholarship program for women in the wine business who, are, who want to advance their goals, especially nice. on the sommelier track, uh, because we, we still have a long way to go. But I'm, it's so exciting to see, for example, Batonage out in Napa. I absolutely love what they're doing. These, these groups of women who are coming together and saying, okay, let's be more resources for one another. Let's not fight against each other anymore. Batonage let's, is the organization? Is the, uh, it's the event, the uh, event. That, they, that they hold. Yeah, right. there's, um, so there's, there's definitely more support groups available for women right. and the men that also want to see more gender equity in our industry. Right. So things like that are happening. Things are getting better, but there's still, still some spots Yes. In the business. Hopefully, uh, next time you come back, we'll have less of that to talk about. Um, you may have answered this a little before, but we could fine-tune the answer. Um, it's good to ask somebody like you what advice you can give to women. And I think you mentioned before, very important to look at the business aspect of it if you want to get in. What else? So I suppose if it's if it's something that's... Um, <laughs> I mean, for anyone, regardless of, of gender, I think one of the challenges that we can have in this business that then, I guess, does make it more complicated for women, we're sitting here right now and we're drinking champagne. And there are a lot of industry events where you're going out and you might be drinking from 6 o'clock at night until midnight. So, and most people, if you're a professional, you will spit into the spittoon. Right. Uh, that can be a complicating factor sometimes. It can be a little more difficult when people uh, don't have some of the, uh, you know, when people have had a few glasses of wine or they may have had a few, you know, been drinking spirits. It can exacerbate the situation. It absolutely can. So you always have to have your wits about you. You have to Women always be very cognizant. Women are potentially more vulnerable? No question about it. Okay. No question. And, and really uh, just uh, making sure that you don't find yourself in that situation and... 
you know, I, mean, I used to get in contests all the time where it was like, I can drink you under the table. It's like, here's a word of advice. Don't play that game with people. Yeah. <laughs> or do it in your own home. Yeah. You know, right, with friends right. do it with friends. But that's, that is not a correct professional thing to do. Um, but, you know, of course, getting into any industry, working in as many facets of it as you can, regardless of if you're a male or female, <clears throat> learning everything about it and, and thinking about all of the things that, uh, that interact with each other. You know, of course, right. quality is essential. You have to have a quality product. But as, as so many winemakers know, getting your product from, from the vineyard and doing all of your perfect farming practices and doing the best that you can in the, in the winery, you can end up with an amazing wine in the glass but there's so much more that needs to happen. And, of course, at the end of the day, it has to make sense for the, the store or the restaurant. And it has to resonate with the consumer, too. It's product. It's, it's in the farm. It's in the cellar. It's marketing. It's consistency. Um, that's good advice. We had a guest on about a year ago, Bianca Bosker. She wrote a book called Cork Dork. And she became mm-hmm. a sommelier through the book. And she talked about going to these wine events, you know, like the La Paule and all of that. And basically every one of these events has a dinner and the dinners are from like six to midnight. And what are you doing? And it's mostly men still, even at Mm -hmm. these things and guys are getting drunk and, you know, there's a handful of women around and it was, she kind of was very vivid how she described it, you know, being a woman, you know, and you sort of pull that out and, you know, that's a good point. Um, all right, let's talk about champagne generally first. Um, you've been in the business for years. Can you point out or notice things that have changed? Wow, there's... Since, you know, I mean, if the list is long, give me the, uh, you know, the obvious stuff. During your tenure and your exposure and all of that stuff, what can you tell me? Uh, well, I'd say it's almost invariably good stuff. I think okay. in general here in the U.S. And, and especially among millennial consumers, we're seeing much more consumption of sparkling wine in general. As and a category. As a category, which uh, I used to live in the East Village, again, many moons ago. And now, you know, if you if you kind of... My friends and I never sat on a, at a brunch table on a Sunday and sat there with a, a bottle of sparkling wine. You know, that was maybe right. you'd have a Bloody Mary if you were day drinking. But, you know, and it's amazing to me now that so many people, even at a, at a younger age than we would normally consider for the sparkling wine category, they love having something bubbly and in a flute in their hand, which is great. And that's boded really well for the champagne industry as well. So we've been growing. The not category has become less celebratory and more, you know, daily or meal or get together. So Absolutely. that's a great thing. Absolutely. And I think as people are, they're, they're, they're used to drinking sparkling wines and they're like, okay, if it is something that, that is a, more of a special occasion, maybe that merits the money that you have to spend on a bottle of champagne, they're very willing to do that because they love drinking wines with bubbles in it. So that's right. great. So from a consumer perspective here in the U.S., that's been fantastic. Then, of course, we've had the growth of the rosé segment where, and not just in, in sparkling, but in still as well. Um, but Laurent Perrier essentially pioneered the non-vintage rosé champagne category back in 1968. So it's kind of funny because I'll get asked, well, what about the rosé trend? Rosés are so hot. I'm like, been well, there doing it's only it. taken us 50 years. You know, it's yeah. been, in, it's, it's, we're, we're so excited that the, the trend is finally, you know, we've the, going the right direction. Uh, but it has been for us. And we're very proud of the fact we consider ourselves having created essentially that category after it was dormant for so many years. Right. Uh, and then you have things like um, on the not so great front, we have champagnes becoming um, less dosage because the uh, because the explain what dosage is. So dosage is the amount of sugar that we would add to the um, uh, to the champagne at the end in order to achieve its final part of level the process of, of making the final. Exactly, product. it's kind of the last step. If you so, will. you're saying less dosage is a trend that you're not loving. It used to be that in champagne. Well, that's, that's, it used to be that in Champagne, our biggest challenge was to achieve ripeness in our grapes because Champagne for many years was the northernmost growing region in the world. And that's no longer the case because as climate change has been happening, one of the, the impacts to the wine industry has been that there are more northerly vineyards. England is a perfect example. And they're making sparkling wines. And they're making sparkling. Right. And then in Champagne, we no longer have to struggle to have ripeness. We actually have much more ripeness than, than we would have had in years past. Uh, where we are picking earlier than we would normally do because the grapes ripen earlier. Uh, so it's a, it's a good thing for the quality of the wines. It's, of course, the other side of that is that it's caused by climate change, which right. you, you know, be very 
very selfish for me to say that's a good thing overall. Right. Um, so, so the styles of champagne have changed. They're, it's made them more approachable. Um, and it's also increased the number of what we would call non-dosage champagnes, which are champagnes that have no sugar added to them whatsoever. Again, we're quite innovators in the champagne category. It was our patriarch, Bernard de Nonancour, that created, that lobbied for the creation within the champagne regulations, this, uh, this idea of a non-dosage champagne, which is, in champagne, so many things are regulated by essentially the government to make sure that we have the same, uh, the, the same quality standards. So he actually worked very hard to create this new category of champagnes called Brut Nature, so a natural Brut champagne, did which has brut, no sugar added. Did Brut just as Brut exist and he developed Brut Nature? There was something called Brut, which is up to 12 grams of sugar okay. per liter in dosage. There was Extra Brut, which is up to six. And then he wanted Brut Nature, which was zero. Okay. And he was, this was in 1981. And he actually received a lot of resistance because people said, no, that's too hard to do. But so they ended up uh, coming to an agreement that they could do three grams of sugar per liter. But we've always done zero and we'll always continue to do zero. Uh, but that's, a, again, a new... And we talk about innovation in champagne. It's been around for about 400 years right. as, a, as a category. Um, but it's, so it's exciting that we had that innovation back right. in 81. What about things like grower champagne, mm -hmm. which is, it's not even buzzy anymore. I mean, a lot more restaurants are carrying a lot more champagne. They're carrying a wide variety. They're carrying a lot more grower. Mm -hmm. Tell me what grower champagne is, just to tell our listeners, and... Any effect on what you're doing? Sure. And if I could, I'd love to kind of start answering that question with, with talking about what it means to have a, a, a non-vintage champagne. And within the champagne world, in, when you usually buy a champagne, all of the champagnes that people are most used to seeing are non-vintage, meaning that it comes from years that could be from a blend of years. Blended, right. Uh, let's say, a, you know, at a minimum of, uh, let's just say five years, let's say. Um, and then a little bit of even older wines blended into that. So we've had to blend years in Champagne because we didn't used to have years that were consistently ripe. So we'd have to blend from different years in order to get something that was always good to drink. So the other thing that we do in Champagne is we... So in layman's terms, you weren't on the hook every year to make that year a vintage year because the quality can vary. And some years you would declare a vintage year, right? Exactly. Okay. In some years, it would be almost impossible to make a, a, a champagne from that year because there just wouldn't be enough sunlight. And now that's no longer the case. So we've always blended years in champagne, and we've always blended grapes. We're one of the few areas in the world where you can blend red and white grapes. There's three grapes, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Meunier. Those last two are red grapes. The first one is a white grape. We blend those together. So that's how we've been able to be... Uh, to make champagne and be a region for the last, you know, four or five centuries. So as things have, have changed climatically in the region, if you are a, a grower, meaning you have a vineyard, you can now expect that that vineyard is going to become completely ripe every year. So it used to be that the, the model was that all of these growers would sell their grapes to the houses, the larger uh, houses, which is of which Laurent Perrier is one, we would buy the grapes every year, knowing that we would have to blend them every year with grapes from other years and grapes from other houses in order to create a drinkable, palatable, and enjoyable champagne. Well, as things are getting warmer, these growers that have, you know, one vineyard, contiguous, kind of look out your back door, you have a few acres. Now that it's warmer, you can expect those grapes to ripen so you can make your own wine every year. So many growers, many people that own vineyards decided, okay, well, I'm going to make my own champagne. So, uh, so there's now hundreds and hundreds more than there have ever been. And at the same time, what, what many people don't realize is that growers frequently make their own champagnes, and they also sell a big segment of their production of their, vi of their vineyards to houses so they can kind of mitigate their risk a little bit. Right. Um, so at Laurent Perrier, we actually work with 1,200 growers every year and we buy grapes from 1200 growers many of whom also make their own branded champagnes but we buy fruit from them as well that become Laurent Perrier and in fact we actually sold shares of Laurent Perrier to our growers at one point to make them like partners yeah because we you know we wanted to we are and we are partners 
We can't exist without it's them. It's cooperative in that sense. In that, not well, cooperative, but it is cooperative in the in the adjectival uh, form right. of of that word. But in a co-op, everything that someone brings, regardless of quality, has to get made into a champagne. At Laurent Perrier, we buy about eighty nine percent of our grapes. Do you grow any? We grow eleven percent of our own. Okay. And our vineyard management team dictates all of the vineyard management practices in that remaining 89 percent and actually we're very proud of the fact that just this past year all of our vineyards under our guidance received what's called the hev certification which is the uh uh actually in, in french it's a uh, valeur environmental which is high environmental value uh, certification and that's a certification that has to do with biodiversity sustainability uh, pesticide use and so there's fertilization. a movement towards sustainability. Absolutely. Is it? Are you at the organic, organic no, it's, stage? No, it's not organic. An and eye it's towards not sustainability and it's a specific certification. Proper practices and certification. Right. And we require that every grape vi- every grape that we buy is farmed using those HEV values that we just all of our vineyards and the vineyards that we buy from became man- uh, certified this past year. So, with all, two quick things. Climate had an effect on the grapes, which had an effect and influence to make growers make some of their own grower champagne because they could. Is it Mm -hmm. fair to simplify it that way? I think that that made it possible for them to rely on being able to produce something every year. Right. And many of what's been exciting for the category is that that means that uh, I mentioned the, the three different grapes that are used. Some of those growers might say, I'm going to make a champagne from my plot that's o- that only has one of these grapes, right. that only has Meunier. It could be a Blanc de Blanc or right. a Chardonnay only. Whatever. Or it could be a Blanc de Noir, a right. white that comes from red ones, from red uh, grapes or, or a single variety. Um, so there's a lot of experimentation, which is really interesting and exciting. There's also a lot of stylistic differences. So uh, it, there could be some that are very oxidative in, in their flavor profiles versus some that are... Uh, you know, Laurent Perrier is the opposite of that. We, we're what we call a reductive style. Well, let, let's let's talk about Laurent Perrier a little now. We talked about champagne. I guess you set the segue up for me. Um, fair to say there's a Laurent Perrier house style or style? Absolutely. So you were kind of moving towards describing that. Let's describe it first, and let's Great. talk about how you get there. It's mix of grapes, you know, things like that. Tell yeah. me, you know, what, what you're doing. Absolutely. It's, it's really, you know, we always have in mind what's the goal. We're going to make a wine. What do we want that wine to taste like? And what are the things that you need to do in the vineyard and also in the winery in order to achieve that style? And at Laurent Perrier, we have, uh, for, for many, many, many decades... We have always wanted to focus on the fruit, uh, meaning the, the grapes. You know, our winemaking starts in the vineyard, as they say, and we want to taste those grapes as the end result. Now, in Champagne, there are still producers, not too, too many, but, um, but still some, who will use oak barrels in their primary fermentation. So in Champagne, of course, we have two different fermentations. We have the first fermentation, which creates uh, wine, still wine, out of grape juice. And then we have the fermentation that creates sparkling wine out of the still wine. In the bottle, right? In the bottle itself. Right. Now, all champagnes, by law, must undergo secondary fermentation in the bottle in which they're sold. So that's all glass all the time. There's a couple of small exceptions for tiny bottles or giant bottles, but that right. doesn't matter. But in that primary fermentation step, winemakers have the option of using various vessels for fermentation, for primary fermentation. At Laurent Perrier, we, since the 1960s, in fact, we were the very first winery in Champagne to do this, we went 100% stainless steel. It used to be wood or potentially concrete, concrete lined with glass. But what we wanted to do was avoid all all potential uh, exposure to oxygen so that you can taste our grapes above anything else. So we're what we call very anaerobic winemaking. So all of our fruit is is harvested in tiny little bins. The bins are rushed to a press house. The press houses, there are, there are hundreds of them. And we have them throughout Champagne because we don't want the grapes to crush themselves. We don't right. want any gravity press and any fermentation to start. So we're absolutely rigid about controlling everything from the time that grape is picked to make sure that there's no exposure of the juice to oxygen so we get the freshest, most pure style of Champagne possible. So that becomes our house style. Right, so the adjectives are freshness. 
Freshness, elegance, and purity is okay. what we strive for at LP. Now, what's the variation? And you can't say yearly because it's not a vintage every year, but the variation of the grape mix. There's Chardonnay, Pinot Meunier, and Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. Are the percentages similar or do they move around a lot? They tend to... And it depends yeah. on the vintage year? It depends on the particular cuvee, and it actually doesn't depend too much on the vintage okay. year. It's never exactly the same. Right. But in our, um, each variety in Champagne brings something different to the blend. So Chardonnay is sometimes called like the, the, the spine, right? And then Pinot Noir is the musculature, and then Pinot Meunier, I kind of, you know, like say it's kind of like baby fat. You know, it's nice when it's young, it's cute, but it doesn't age well. Right. So, you know, each, each grape not has its much. own, not too much right. and, and, and not for too long. Uh, so for our non-vintage brut, which is uh, called La Cuvée, we actually have 55% Chardonnay in that blend, more or less, every year. Right. So that's and, the range there. Exactly. And Chardonnay is actually the least planted and most expensive grape in Champagne. And we have just about more of it in our non-vintage than, than any other house. Uh, because, again, that's that, that spine that we have, that's that freshness. That's that elegance. It sets up the style you're looking for. Exactly. Right. Exactly. All right, we're, uh, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking to Michelle DeFeo. Michelle's the president of Laurent Perrier U.S. When we come back, um, let's talk a little more about Laurent Perrier, maybe a little history. Um, you mentioned some of the innovations, but let's talk about some of the things they did. Um, I want to subject you to our wine list. <laughs> and we've been tasting, drinking the grand... Siecla. Siecla. Perfect. And we're going to, for our weekly wine sip, we're going to taste the Cuvée Rosé. Um, and we'll get into a little more of the specifics with those wines. Um, we'll be right back. You're listening to The Grape Nation. I'm Sam Ben Ruby. This episode is brought to you by MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink. Featuring a variety of interactive displays, MOFAD encourages eaters of all ages to be curious about food. The museum currently operates MOFAD Lab, a 5,000 square foot experimental space in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where Chow, making the Chinese American restaurant, is currently on show until the end of March 2019. This exhibition celebrates the birth and evolution of Chinese-American restaurants, tracing their nearly 170-year history, and sparking conversations about food culture, immigration, and what it means to be American. It highlights the evolution timeline of Chinese-American restaurant menus, dating back to 1910, and also highlights a tasting section where participants get to enjoy tastings created by the country's most talented chefs who specialize in Chinese-American cuisine. Make sure you check out Chow while you still can. The exhibition closes at the end of March 2019. Check out MoFad's tastings and extensive event calendar at mofad.org slash events. We are back. We are back with my guest, Michelle DeFeo. Michelle is the president of Laurent Perrier U.S. Um, we've been talking about champagne. We've been talking about Laurent Perrier. Um, Laurent Perrier has a history and a reputation for being an innovator and creating some innovations in champagne. I think we talked about a few of them. You talked about fermenting the wine in all stainless steel. I mean, everybody wasn't doing that then. Is that true? That is true. When that did that, true. that goes back to when? So we've actually been around since 1812, but because of our location in this tiny village out in the middle of a bunch of Grand Cru vineyards in this really just a speck on a map called Tor Sur Marne, uh, we were pretty badly decimated during World War I and uh, the house almost ceased producing. So it was actually purchased by a, a woman for her, for her son to run when he got back from World War II. And he was actually he was a, a wonderful French resistance fighter. When he came back after the war, Laurent Perrier was only producing about 1,000 bottles a year. Hmm. 
And it was, uh, things were rough in that part of France at the time. And so what he said was, you know, he, his goal was to bring Laurent Perrier back and, and to do what he could do to bring France back to its glory. So he said, what can I do, especially if it's something that has some kind of historical rele relevance or historical basis? So he started doing things by, in an innovative way, partially because he had no choice, right? Necessity is the mother of invention. And so he said, okay, well, you know, wood was expensive. So, okay, what, and he, he wanted to do things in a certain style, but he said, okay, let's focus on, on not only just having something in, in steel, but let's go all the way. Let's make that be our house style. Let's do things that are new and different because we're not producing anything now. Without any constraints of the past, what should we start creating? So actually the first, he started just making a non-vintage brute. We, we spoke about what that is, kind of the standard bearer. But the first new champagne that he decided to make was actually the champagne that we're drinking right now, the Grand Siac. Grand Siacle. 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 I won't get, get too Frenchy me. on that there. Yeah, Sorry. Don't confuse me. That's the old French major in me coming back, right? Okay. But Siecle, you can actually pronounce all the letters, which is rare in French. Well, let's spell it. It's S I E C L E. Correct. And so that means. So when you look century. for Laurent Perrier, Siecle the, is the, spelled. Yeah, the Grand Siecle, and that means the great century. So that actually refers to the time of Louis XIV in the 18th century at the Chateau of. Early 18th century at the Chateau of Versailles. Uh, this is Louis the Fourteenth, not Louis the Sixteenth. Very different people. Uh, and it, it was at this time at the Chateau of Versailles that French gastronomy became a thing. That was around the first time that that champagne was was adopted as this drink of royalty. It became the, the drink of the kings. And it's also the time that led to the uh, the Enlightenment. So if by many, it's considered the most illustrious time in French history. So if you're a French history, you know, if you study French history, you'll hear about the Grand Siècle, and you'll actually see on every bottle of Grand Siècle a little face that is actually the face of Louis XIV. You'll see it on the on the front, right on the oh, yeah, on the yeah. neck of the bottle on there. Top. The Sun King? The Sun King, That's exactly. So the Sun King reigned during the Grand Siècle. So Bernard, again, having come back from the war and said, I want to bring this part of France back to its previous glory. It's okay, what is the most glorious time in French history? And he said, I want to make the best possible champagne that I can produce, just like France was at its absolute best at that time of history. So he started saying, you know, different trials with his, with his chef de cave, which is our, our word for winemaker in, in, Fran in Champagne. And he landed after many, many trials on blending about half Chardonnay to half Pinot Noir, slightly favoring the Chardonnay, but not doing it from one single vintage year and not doing it from any random number of years, but always finding three years that had complementary characteristics that, that improved one another, where the whole was greater than the sum of its parts. So it was three years, not necessarily consecutive. Correct. Three, but three different years that he would select. Exactly. Okay. I mean, nature is... But he is would a, limit it to three. Limited it to three, one that had structure, one that had finesse, and, 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 and one that, that, that had elegance. And the... Uh, essentially the, the theory is, you know, nature never gives us the perfect year, so we'll have to create it. So that was what he started doing, and he released the first iteration of Grand Siec in 1958. So it's relatively young. It is. As it far is as indeed. a, a brand. This, yes, we'll be coming out with our 24th iteration of Grand Siec this coming year. All right, so that's one of them. We talked about um, no dosage, mm -hmm. a very dry um, uh, champagne. Mm-hmm. And yes, that was our Ultra Brute, released in 1981. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a strong push for a rosé champagne, which you guys get a lot of credit for. And we're going to try that for our weekly wine sip. Talk to me about reviving the uh, rosé category. So I, I mentioned earlier that there were uh, three, that currently there are three key grapes in the champagne region, uh, from which just about everything is made from. But way back when, when sacramental wine was made in the Champagne region, the very, very first wines that were made, they actually were all made from a red-skinned grape. And when you, when you crush a grape, there are, you get flavor, you get color, you get aromatics, and you get tannin from the skin of the grape. And the longer that the juice of the grape stays in contact with the skin, the more of those things that you're going to get. So the challenge is, how do you get the things that you want? How do you get the flavor? How do you get the aromatics without getting things like bitter tannins? Uh, so uh, that was a very 
you know, now we understand all these things, right? right. But, but back in the then. 1600s, they didn't. It was like, we're going to crush it. We're going to leave it on there for a while. And, See you know, so all of the original sh champagnes actually were pink. And they, they, they made the connection that if we take the pinkness out, right, if we don't leave it on the skin, then we're not going to get some of that negative stuff. We're not going to get those harsh tannins. So for many years in Champagne, like for centuries, they were trying really hard to get the pink out, to have a nice white Champagne. That's what they wanted. So when Bernard said, you know, but there, there had been pink Champagnes before. And he said, well, what if we could get that color and get those aromatics from the skin, but not get any of the bitterness? How could we do that? So they thought he was nuts, and he started doing all these trials. You know, after all these centuries of trying to get the pink out, he said, I want to have lots of pink in. So our chef de cave at the time, by the way, we've only had three since, 19, since 1949. Uh, so his chef de cave at the time, our second chef de cave, actually had a PhD in enology from Bordeaux, specializing in cold temperature aromatic extraction. Perfect. And he said, well, this sounds like fun. I want to get the colors and the flavors out of Pinot Noir grapes without any of the negative stuff. So they worked at it for many, many years, and they finally found the right way to do it, which is by letting the grape skins and the juice stay in contact with one another for about 48 to 72 hours in a very, very cold environment before taking that juice off of the skins and having that become our rosé. So that became, a, you know, that was a kind of a shock to the industry. We released that in 1968, and we had many, many, many others that, that followed suit after that. Um, so cold fermentation for a set period of time sounded like two, three days, and yep. that got you to the rosé that had all the characteristics, you know, that you were That's looking right. for. And to be honest, there, we're really one of the only people that still make it like that, even though just about everyone makes a rosé champagne. Just not now. Dirty little secret is that most champagne brands add red wine at some other point in the process, kind of like food coloring. For the color. Just for the color. Right. So this is really a natural. It's a uh, harder way to make it, but the way that has the best flavor. Um, and we're going to taste that uh, in a few minutes when we get towards the end of the show. I'll uh, get Marissa to pop that. Um, all right. I mean, I know we can go on, you know, uh, and talk about a lot more things, but I really want you to, uh, answer my wine list. Oh, these are the hard questions. These are the hard oh, questions. No. <laughs> and the wine list is five questions. We ask all our guests the same questions. Um, put a little slant toward champagne, you know, wherever champagne makes sense to answer it, but it's not a champagne only thing. Um, cause your exposure to champagne is, you know, more than most people. So the first question is, what are you drinking now? And that is what's in your fridge at home? What's on your table at home? What are you tasting at work? What are you seeking out? Does the season have anything to do with it? What's Michelle drinking now? And it just mm. doesn't have to be business. Well, of course, I'm, I'm very lucky in that, uh, I got a very good price on my Laurent Prairie champagne. Mm -hmm. So I will say that in the winter, when it's cold out, uh, I love to have a champagne that's more robust, that's more full-bodied. So we do have... Uh, Which one? So we actually make a vintage. We have the vintage 19... Uh, I'm sorry, vintage 2007 right now. And because it's it's really so old, it's very expansive on the palate. So, you know, when, when I want that kind of big, rich, enveloping flavor, I go for I go for a, a vintage, vintage champagne. Yeah, a vintage and that's, champagne. That's a 12-year-old... Um, Mo yeah, most champagnes are in their 2009s yeah. now. They release them, but we actually hold ours back quite a bit. Uh, so even uh, we're, we're still in our 07s, and the benefit of that is more cellar aging, more aging on cork even, uh, so we get a nice, rich taste. All right, so that, anything else, non-champagne? Well, uh, you know, to be very honest, we're, uh, we're, we're big Beaujolais fans. Okay, in you're, my house. you're singing so, to the choir here. All right, good. I think Beaujolais good. is uh, a great choice now. Um, it's very food friendly. It's very drinkable. Yeah. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Two good answers. Yeah, great years, great string of vintages too. Yes, and, you know, 14, it's, it's, 15, 16, even 17, even 17 looks good, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's great good values. to drink young. Um, we're soulmates on that for sure. <laughs> Do you have a favorite wine and food pairing? It doesn't have to be something you eat every month or week, but is there something you've eaten more than a few times that is like, wow, this is... Well, yeah, of course, we are, we are sitting here in Roberta's, right? So that biases me a little bit. I meant to preface one thing. There's a uh, Grape Nation rule. Oh, 
that says you can't say champagne and oysters. Oh, no. Which no. is the classic. That's but classic. But champagne has come up in that answer a lot. And were you going to say pizza? I was going to say pizza. Champagne and pizza? Yeah, as a matter of fact, when we actually had... Not we the had a, first. We had a big birthday party for our rosé champagne. Pairing. It's it's fantastic. And I absolutely love it with just a, a margarita pizza. Although I will say as well, another thing that I love with our rosé champagne, kind of going back to the brunch thing, I, I love day drinking. I'll be very honest with you. you know, And also your palate's so fresh at the beginning of the day. If you're having people See, over kids, brunch, the way you get to be president <laughs> of a big champagne house is drink during the day, That's right? right. You got, it's all training. Yeah, it's all training. Good example. <laughs> but having rosé, like a brunch with rosé and bagels with salmon, with smoked salmon, with lox. Uh, Great that with is the salmon. Absolutely fantastic. Rosé and smoked salmon. Good call on that. Specifically rosé, right? Absolutely with the rosé because it's all Pinot Noir. All right, good answers on that. We've had pizza and champagne before, but a first on the uh, bagels with salmon and rosé. That's a good one. All right, Um, I know you're busy. I know you're out in Long Island City, but I know you get around. Do you have a favorite wine restaurant and or bar, a place that does it well, and it could lean towards champagne, it could be in the city, it could be out by you, it could be Jersey. Just tell me somebody who's doing it well. Selection, service, knowledge, environment. Gosh, you know, the, the first things that come to mind um, are actually two places in California. Can I go that far afield? Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, one is in Sonoma, which is such a, uh, you know, you wouldn't think that a champagne producer would right. say, oh, go to Sonoma. But there's a fantastic champagne bar there called Sai. It has S I G H. Sigh. Huh. Like the, okay. They've got an adorable little pug. So I love the ambiance right and away. And they have a great champagne a fantastic selection. Fantastic champagne selection and a and a great barman named Joe. Give him a little shout okay. out. Okay. So I w- so that's a wonderful place to visit. <laughs> also, amazingly, this this is something that uh, we we were talking about millennials earlier. Right. I just met someone in Sacramento, California, a couple of weeks ago, actually, at a wine bar there, a champagne bar called Fizz, and he is a, he's a a millennial who absolutely fell in love with champagne and sparkling wine and he opened up his own place and it's it's fantastic where is this again this is in sacramento okay uh which wasn't a place you would necessarily not a destination but if you're there you could wind up in a very cool spot and then of course here in new york i mean cork buzz is classic and fantastic and and laura's wonderful so you know for champagne and everything else those are all good ones um and i like the mixed geography do you have a let's the question is favorite all-time wine let's answer it Mm. favorite all-time wine favorite all-time champagne it used to be answered the rarest and most expensive now it sort of falls to experience you know when i got engaged we popped this bottle and it becomes memorable give me an all-time fave or faves. Mm. Ooh, that's Anything a really come to good mind? Question. It's a really good question. Um, I would say that um, I, I can't tell you what the producer, who the producer was, um, but I, I did a year abroad uh, in college okay. in the Loire Valley, and we went to the grocery store to find things to drink, and you know I was just looking for pretty labels. And I picked up something. This was in, as I said, in Loire Valley. I picked up something called a Vouvray Molleux. Okay. It was, like, it was literally a word so, I'd never seen before. And I thought, oh, vocabulary Vouvray, lesson. Molleux, which is, I think. Which I know now is an, is a semi, is a, right. an off dry Chenin right. Blanc, which right. then so I had no idea. So we're talking Chenin Blanc. Right. And of course, we're talking about a 19 year old palate, right? And, and that just made a great impression on it you. It was the most Memorable? delicious thing I'd I ever mean, tasted. You're recounting- Oh my God! I mean, of course, this is again. This is before we had phones in our, po- you know, cameras in our pockets. Right. So I didn't take a picture of the label, but I will never forget tasting this Vouvray Molle and saying, "I never knew that uh, that something that I would drink would taste so amazing." That's the type of answer I'm looking for. No. Just a shameless plug. Next week, Pascaline Le Peltier will ah. be on to celebrate <laughs> our hundredth B show. Michelle's with us with our hundredth <laughs> A show with a little champagne. Pascaline is truly the greatest Chenin Blanc cheerleader in the world. So she'd be oh. happy to hear that. Can you give me a <laughs> similar wonderful. story with a champagne, either through exposure in business or another time? Did you have access to something? Oh, wow. I, you know, well, for me, I suppose that it's, um, uh, this is going to sound, of course, you know, really, uh, no. Kind of self-serving, but no. you know, it is what it is. You know, no. I, I mentioned Bernard de Nonancourt, and I mentioned him as 
you know, I almost feel bad when I mention something like that because it feels like something in our marketing materials. But I've met this man. Again, he's a decorated hero of the French Resistance. I've sat next to him at dinners. He was known as the Grand Bernard, the Big Bernard. And he he's the reason I came back to Laurent Perrier after leaving. He was an absolutely incredible man. And I remember sitting next to him in, uh, in the, the Chateau of Laurent Perrier and having a dinner. And we had uh, the 1985 uh, Cuvée Alexandra, which is our rosé prestige cuvée. And I just remember sitting there and kind of to bring it back to full circle is how did this, how did this chick from northwestern New Jersey end up, you know, in the champagne business? I just remember sitting next to this amazing man. What year was this? This was in 2000. Okay, so it was a while ago. This was a while ago. It was my first go around with, okay. with Laurent Perrier. And sitting next to him and, uh, and, and tasting this wine, this, this beautiful uh, prestige, rosé prestige cuvée, and sitting in the chateau and just thinking, how did I get here? And how lucky am I? And, uh, and I, I, I always try to tr- remain grateful. And when I, whenever I even so look at a label So the story is of, a great person. Yeah. A great time and opportunity and also a great champagne. And an amazing champagne. That, Life doesn't get any better. Th- that's how you answer that question. Okay. <laughs> All right. Last question. Maybe a little harder for you. Um, and it doesn't have to be champagne, but, you know, our guests are winemakers, wine journalists, wine retailers, sommeliers. No pressure. We ask people, recommend the best wine retail around 15 20 bucks, and give me a red and give me a white. And this takes you out of your category a little. So it may not be champagne, but anything come to mind? I mean, you voluntarily brought up sparkling wine. I so did. I'm going to help you here. And as a white, there are some great value sparkling wines. I, I'm for for a white. I'm going to go f- to Cremant d'Alsace. Okay, around that. And level. I think you could find bottles 15, 18. Yeah, 20 it'd, be, bucks. it'd be a little tough, you know, find under twenty, but just kind of right pushing yeah. up against that and the level. Quality I mean, and they're interesting. Yeah, I think they're they're wonderful wines. They're fun. They're aromatic. Um, so at, you know, at that price point, I, I don't think that you can go wrong. All right, give me. Can you think of anything red? You can go. I'm gonna go back to Beaujolais. I'm gonna go to Beaujolais. You can even get Beaujolais Village. I mean, get Beaujolais Village. I don't have to go anywhere beyond that. I'm a happy camper. (laughs) Good for you. You didn't even rally on that. You nailed it. (laughs) All right, Um, great job. As I tell everyone, we're gonna post your answers on social media. Um, People are always interested to hear what you know people in the business are drinking and you know what they're exposed to. So in the next week. We'll post Michelle's uh, wine list answers, and we're going to pop a uh, a uh, Laurent Perrier uh, Cuvée Rosé. Um, let me just set it up, Michelle. Every week we taste a different wine on air for our weekly wine sip, and I asked Michelle if she'd be gracious enough to bring in some wine, and not only did she bring in wine, she brought in two wines, two champagnes. Um, we've been tasting the Grand Siècle, which is three vintages, and it's a special bottling for them. It's in a very interesting bottle, um, so look out for that. And we're going to taste something that I think Laurent Perrier is very well known for, and that is the um, the uh, Cuvée Rosé. So, Michelle, tell me a little more about this, and we're going to taste and evaluate it. So I mentioned that uh, that Bernard went through a, a bunch of trials to, with it, with Alain Terrier, with our chef de cave at the time, to figure out what to, uh, what grapes to use and what method to use to create this wine. And what they landed on, actually, was very simple. It's actually 100% Pinot Noir. Okay. So it comes only from red grapes, and it Is also it traditionally always 100% Pinot. As Mo- for with the exception of one grower, we're the only 100% Pinot Noir that I'm aware of. Not out okay. in the world, but every... Oh, for Laurent Perrier. You make it 100%. always. It's always been 100% okay. Pinot Noir. That's all it will all be. Right. And it's chosen only from vineyards that are labeled Grand Cru. That's okay. an appellation regulation. So it's the best grapes. It is the best grape. So uh, there are 17 Grand Cru vineyards, and we, we pull from about 11 of those vineyards. The, those vineyards may change every so year. So every year... You're looking at 17, and of the 17, you could do 15, 11. This one's 11, and it could be a different 11 this year. Might be 10, might be 12, yeah. 
Okay. Um, so it's it's a quality wine as far as grape selection and all of that. All right. So let's uh, let's give it a sniff and let's throw it over the tongue and <laughs> let's uh, evaluate it a little. So let's first go with color. It's a gorgeous salmon. I mean, it's beyond pink. It's got a beautiful, deep... What's your description? I think beyond pink, I, I, I'm going to steal that from you. I think that that's, okay. a, that's a perfect description. You can have it. Thank you. And it's if you were to line it up against other rosé champagnes, it would really jump out at deeper, you. Deeper, richer. It's so different. Yeah. Yes. It's so much... So and it is... There's there's a little, like, you know, salmon in it, which is nice. All right. Let's go to the nose. I'm going to rely on you because you've probably sniffed more champagne than I have, although I'm no sloucher. <laughs> Um, what do we get on the nose? Well, on I'd this? love to know what you think as well. I mean, I, I want or, you first, okay. and then I'll or, tell I mean, you. My, my traditional uh, and what I what I normally smell. Of course, I may have cellar palate as well. It's just it's bright red fruit. It's it's that's fruity the first thing I get is yeah. fruit, but red fruit, raspberries. You know, in, um, bright just, red, just intense, and even a strawberry and a strawberry aroma, and get, also kind of a blood orange. Okay, uh, I get a little the typical very light. I don't know if it's it may even be more sweet pastry than a brioche. Just mm. a, a little of that. What else do we get? No, I, I like the brioche. I mean, this is aged for uh, for five years in our cellars. So mm. that's a, a chemical reaction called autolysis happens during that time. And one of the hallmarks of that process is is, is known as, as brioche. So okay. absolutely. All absolutely. right. All right. Now, let's go mouthfeel. And in talking mouthfeel, how does it feel in the mouth versus other champagnes? And let's talk about bubbles. To me, it looks like very small, fine bubbles. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you really get them on the palate. They're kind of evenly coating your palate. Mm. Again, with that extended aging. Right away. Hmm? Yeah. Right away, you get the bubbles on the palate. Absolutely. But they're not aggressive. They're, they're very no. velvety. And that's, again, a function of this long aging. So you, the longer a champagne is aged, the, the, the more velvety and, and supple in texture those bubbles can feel. All there. All right. Now, palate. Does the palate replicate the nose or what else do we pick up on the palate it's completely um uh, kind of orthogonal to the nose if you will because it's not sweet so you get this beautiful fruit aroma and you get you smell this brioche so you're inclined to think well this might be sweet and there is no sweetness whatsoever no this is uh, uh nine grams in the dosage uh which is fairly low for a brut champagne uh it's quite low for a brute champagne, but there, you don't get any impression of residual sugar on right. the palate. Right. So this None is not, that. even though it's a rosé, it's not something that should be, uh, it's not really, it's not a dessert champagne. It's not something that should be had with sweet food. It's something that is a... So my next question always is, what's our best pairings with this particular... So what would you think about smoked salmon with this? Now I think it would be great. It. I okay, think it would the it. acidity would hold up to a fish like salmon, which has a little oil, a yeah, little fishiness, fattiness, yep. fattiness but yep. you know, pleasant and all of that. What else? Well, this is something that um, it is the best pairing that I've ever had with rosé, but it's not something I can cook myself. So I always hate to recommend things that, you know, you get lucky burnt if you chicken? put them on a menu. I know I'm really good at burnt chicken. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, what were you going to say? Uh, I once had a duck breast with a Bing cherry reduction. So the sweetness of the Bing cherry, mm -hmm. duck, which is very rich and fatty. Again with the fat. This yep. just lays on top of it perfectly. It was an absolute perfect match. Great. Yeah. Um, other poultry? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Sure. There's many different kinds of poultry that this would go with. And again, it's 100% Pinot Noir. So it has right. this tremendous versatility. Anything, you know, any poultry is great. Uh, a richer fish would work really well. All right. So Laurent Perrier is a fine champagne house. Um, we're talking about, you know, some of the better representations in the champagne world. Just give people an idea of the retail on the Cuvée Rosé. Sure. The rosé you can find between about $80 and $100. Very reasonable for this quality. For and all the Grand Cru. Siecle. The Grand Siecle you'd find between $125 and $150. Right. And that's a premium champagne and competes with many champagnes in that range that are, you know, more money. Um, so um, keep an eye out for these champagnes. You know, I think we did a good job explaining them and what they pair with and uh, what goes into them. Michelle, we have to wrap up the show. Um, 
I want to thank you for coming in. If you have My a pleasure. question, suggestion, wine happening, or event, hit me up at Sam at thegrapenation.com. That's Sam at thegrapenation.com. Follow us on Facebook at The Grape Nation. Follow us on Instagram. A little confusing, but we're at S Ben Ruby and the hashtag The Grape Nation. Um, on Twitter, we're at Ben Ruby and the hashtag The Grape Nation. You can subscribe to The Grape Nation podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. As I said earlier, we're going to post Michelle's wine list, and we'll list all the uh, champagnes we drank today on our social media, so look out for that in the next few days. Uh, Michelle, if people want to get more information on Laurent Perrier website, what's the best thing? And tell me where we could follow them on social media. So you can follow us at, uh, at Cham- uh, Laurent Perrier US on Instagram. And also our Rosé, which has all of our events coming up with Rosé. Has its own mm -hmm. handle, right? Has its own, uh, even its own website. So you can uh, see all these events at cuverose.com, which is C-U-V-E-E-R-O-S-E.com. All right. And the website is Laurent Perrier US or just Laurent Perrier? Maybe just Laurent Perrier.com. L-A-U-R-E-N-T-P-E-R-R-I-E-R. Um, I want to thank our guest, Michelle DeLeo. She is the president of Laurent Perrier U.S. for coming in and uh, talking about champagne. I want to thank Amanda at the Engineer Board, and I want to thank everyone at Heritage Radio Network. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.